So I'm talking today about combinations uh, of immunotherapies, and that includes uh, combinations of two different immunotherapies together, in fact two or more, uh, but also combinations with more conventional treatments as well. And I guess what I'll be trying to do is to illustrate uh, why there may be benefit in using combinations, but also some of the pitfalls of, of looking at combinations and trying to convince your audience that uh, when they're thinking of designing their own clinical trials, they need to think about things in a way that examines uh, combinations that may result in synergistic benefit to a patient rather than simply additive benefit of the components of the combinations, which I think is a bit of an issue at the moment. Yes, well, so combinations of immunotherapies have now become standard of care in the two diseases that I treat, melanoma and kidney cancer. Um, so combination ipilimumab and nivolumab is standard treatment for advanced melanoma. And uh, I'll be presenting data, and James Larkin presented a, a bit of it today, um, um, with the BMS214 studies showing combination ipi and nevo in kidney cancer is also significantly better than conventional treatment with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So in those two diseases, combinations of two immunotherapy drugs, two checkpoint inhibitors, um, have uh, become standard of care because they've shown themselves to be superior to, to, um, to their comparators. Um, you can do, uh, that's an important element to the question. Uh, what we're learning is that the toxicity profile is very much dose and schedule dependent of the, of, of the drugs that we're looking at. Uh, the dose of ipilimumab for melanoma in combination is higher than the dose of ipilimumab in the renal cancer uh, uh, schedule uh, and we see differing toxicities as, as a result of that. I, I, I think one of the issues about toxicity is what the purpose of treatment is. So pa patients who are treated with high dose chemotherapy with metastatic germ cell tumours have very severe toxicities but they're treated with curative intent and you justify the toxicities because you're treating with curative intent. And actually, I think that's now the case with immunotherapy for melanoma and kidney cancer. It may not be the case for immunotherapy yet with some of the other more common diseases. And so I think, that, so I think the efficacy signal is an important component of considering whether a, a toxicity is justifiable or not. The other issue is, is really about trial design and, and readout because it comes back to this um, uh, key point about why we're giving immunotherapy in the first place and we're not giving immunotherapy to try and gain short-term palliation of patients like uh, my colleagues who treat epithelial cancers with conventional chemotherapy do. What we're trying to do is to get long-term durable disease control and actually I'm after my patients not dying from their cancer. That's my goal. So that means that the, 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 the goal is long-term benefit, but the trial readouts are very often short-term. And it may well be that short-term readouts are not representative of the long-term benefit. And so you can make premature and flawed decisions uh, about the value of drugs because you're not looking late enough and you're looking at uh, endpoints that are too early. Uh, now that has to be balanced against obvious uh, commercial and clinical pressures to get active drugs uh, um, licensed and, and reimbursed as soon as possible. So there is a tension there between a pressure to get things out early, but where the efficacy signal, the important element of the efficacy signal, might not be most apparent until later. Yeah, uh, yeah, we do a lot and uh, actually I embrace those conversations and the more somebody comes in with uh, having done some legwork on, on what's going on, I think the higher quality generally of the consultation. Um, I think the reality is that we are inevitably restricted by um, nice approval and reimbursement decisions in the UK. Uh, that's not a, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's just a, a, a reality check. And so there are often limits on what we can do but I also think that patients have a right to be aware of where the data is heading. And, and also what I, I think is the best, the best treatment for them. 
And I will describe that in a way that, 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 that takes into account of what's available in the NHS, but I will also be explicit about what may be coming or what isn't available in the NHS, because I feel when people come to me for advice, they're coming for my advice about the field and not advice about NHS reimbursement decisions. A uh, key message would be that it's a fascinating, exciting field. Um, combinations will be the standard of care, but there are so many drugs there that the way we do, uh, the way we assess combination uh, immunotherapies needs to be quite thoughtful. And we need um, uh, something I haven't mentioned so far, which is high-end translational work to really instruct which patients are going to have benefit from which combinations. At the moment, we have patients who have long-term benefit and many who don't. The question is, can we be a bit more selective about who we treat with the currently available drugs and who may require some of the newer combinations? And I think that's, that's essential. Mm -hmm.